Perfect. Okay, so morning everybody. I'm very glad and honored this morning to have here again at the Samos conference. Uh, Onur Mutlu uh, is a professor at ETH Zurich and also uh, adjunct professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, his uh, main areas of uh, expertise are uh, as you see in the title, <laughs> memory-centric computing, computer architectures, uh, and many other topics related to this uh, main issue. So it's uh, <laughs> my great pleasure and let you uh, start uh, your talk, Onur. Okay, thank, thank you. you for... Thank you very much, Christina, and thanks for coming. It's... How many people were here last year when we had the tutorial on memory-centric computing? Okay, that's good. I can use. Okay, you are, you are here, of course. <laughs> I'm going to use mostly the same slides, but I'm going to fit that five hour event into 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. I will not <laughs> cover everything that we covered uh, that time, but uh, essentially, we had a nice sessions last, a nice session last year about memory centric computing where we discussed a lot of issues. And then this year, we're talking about uh, the workload perspective. But I think it's important to understand a broader perspective of memory-centric computing uh, as well. So basically, I'm going to skip a lot of slides, uh, but uh, you can. Uh, I'm happy to send you the slides, and you can find them at some point available online as well. Uh, so uh, the main issue is we're bottleneck by data today in many workloads. Important workloads are all data intensive, and they require rapid and efficient processing of data. And data is increasing. Basically, it's exploding. We want uh, we're generating more data. And we, can, we need to perform more sophisticated analyses on data. And clearly, an important workload, since we're talking about workloads, an important workload is neural networks. And neural networks is growing. Uh, you can see this in uh, uh, current developments in GPT, for example, different versions of it, large language models, et cetera. But you can see that both the compute requirements and the memory requirements are growing. And as a result, people are looking at different architectures that put computation and memory together uh, to do that. There are many ways of doing it, of course, uh, doing near data computation or memory centric computation. These folks from Cerebras, this is a nice talk from the Cerebras' chief architect, they basically build huge wafer scale chips where they essentially have lots of SRAM uh, closely uh, coupled uh, to computation units. And if you're interested, you can learn more about it. And clearly, neural networks is not the only workload that's interesting, but maybe there are other workloads that we should not ignore in the world. Uh, they may be even more important uh, going into the future, like some of these other workloads that we've been dealing with. And data is a performance energy bottleneck in those workloads as well. And if you look at the mobile end, there are many workloads that we use. And again, data is a bottleneck in those workloads as well. So I'm going to give you some examples in this talk as time permits. Uh, I'm sure Georgi yeah, Georg would ensure that <laughs> I'm done on time now that he's arrived. <laughs> but I get a couple of Sorry, I, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I get a couple more minutes because he arrived late, as you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so uh, I will talk a little bit about one workload, one particular workload that's I think quite interesting. Uh, Taha gave a talk about that yesterday, for example. I think this is genome analysis, and this is a, an exciting area because there's a lot of data that's generated uh, in genome analysis, and. Uh, and I think I think of this as not just genome analysis, but more biological sequence analysis. Genome genomics is one part of it. There are other parts like protein analysis and uh, and more coming down the road, uh, or multimodal analysis that has multiple different types of uh, biological data that we want to really uh, analyze. And if you look at the applications that we build, uh, we're basically bottlenecked in scientific discovery based on the speed and efficiency of analysis that we need to do. Uh, and clearly, there are many, many applications that we can have. Again, we don't have time to go over it. At some point, maybe there's a, there should be a tutorial on this topic uh, uh, going into the future. Uh, but the reason uh, why we're having a lot of explosion of applications and also data is we have these devices that are extremely capable. This is a nanopore sequencing device. This is an old version. Uh, it's not the smallest version, let's say. Uh, but this is relatively cheap. And uh, it can generate a lot of data. So this is a great data generator. You can actually sequence your own uh, uh, genome if you actually know how to do it uh, with this device. But unfortunately, it's not a good data analyzer. So you need to move the data somewhere else. The, the device cannot do processing of the data. And if you move the data to a laptop, that laptop is not good enough 
to do many, many analyses. So if you want to do sophisticated analysis, you need to move the data to a data center, for example, or somewhere else to actually do the analysis. So you cause a lot of data movement and also a lot of inefficiency. So that's essentially the theme of this talk. If you don't get anything out of this talk, data is a bottleneck in all of the interesting applications and we need to put memory uh, computation together with memory to uh, uh, ensure that data doesn't move and doesn't become a bottleneck. So I think uh, to generalize this, Essentially, uh, if you uh, uh, this picture, I think summarizes it nicely. We have special purpose machines that are extremely good at data generation. This is a genomics sequence, another, another example of it, Illumina. Uh, they're extremely fast and specialized. And then we need to move the data far away to do the analysis. So it, this causes a lot of data movement. And we usually use general purpose machines that are not specialized for the data or the application. As a result, it's, it's slow. It's slow in multiple ways because of the data movement as well as the inefficient uh, uh, processing capability. And again, this picture is, I think, similar in many data generation engines. This is genome analysis, but video. If you look at video, for example, we have very specialized cameras that generate data. If you look at the web, we have very specialized mechanisms to generate web clicks, et cetera, a lot of information over there. So I think we need to change this picture somehow so that we can make the data movement minimized as much as possible and uh, this processing capability balanced. And that's, I think, the core of memory-centric or data-centric computation. You need to do the uh, data analysis close to where the data is generated and also, uh, and also in a way that's specialized to uh, the application that you're going to, uh, that's going to use that data. Okay, I can talk a lot about gen genome analysis, but we don't have time. Uh, if you're interested, there's a talk that we're giving uh, in DAC next week in San Francisco that talks about this. I'm gonna skip some of these because these are essentially uh, appli uh, applications like you can, uh, some, some, some references to uh, genome analysis. I will give you one example. I think today, uh, today you can do some analysis using FPGAs. It's nice uh, because you have, you, can, you have FPGA boards that have high bandwidth memory attached to them. You can buy them or you can work with people who have them. Uh, and the good thing is you can essentially offload sophisticated parts of the computation it, and uh, specialize the computation in the reconfigurable logic over here and enable that computation to have access to high bandwidth memory with low latency and reasonably low energy without going through the CPU. So this is an example of memory-centric computing. Uh, let's say baby step towards it. It's near memory clearly compared to the CPU. And even if you do the, uh, when you do this carefully, you get a lot of performance energy, energy benefits. So I think this is good news in the sense that you get significant performance energy benefits in this particular case on weather modeling and genome analysis. Uh, uh, and we, we use the system actually. This is, so these are real system results, uh, but this is not, uh, I think the end of it. There's a lot more that ne we need to do. Essentially, can we actually do a lot more computation uh, near memory or inside the memory? Okay, so I can, again, I can talk a lot about genome analysis. I'm gonna skip those, uh, but I, I'll just point you to a lot of uh, different things over here. So I think uh, in line with what uh, we're talking about here, this is uh, really applications of memory-centric computing. Uh, we really need to study applications. I, like, I, I need to make that point. As, as uh, people who are designing systems or building architectures, we really need to understand the full stack of the application. And uh, genomics is, a, is an example, and it has lots of applications and lots of use cases. That's why we've been developing courses like this where we focus on genomics and also accelerating genomics. But again, there are other applications. Genomics is a, it happens to be a very wide domain, let's say. And uh, in line with this, we've been organizing uh, workshops at uh, conferences like WECOM, uh, which is essentially the, um, uh, one of the major uh, molecular biology conferences uh, to, let's say, educate that community also. I think uh, systems and architecture communities are actually very open to applications, but uh, application communities or algorithms communities are less open to accelerating things using systems. So it's good to synergize these communities together. Okay, so I think I've uh, given you uh, uh, examples of how data overwhelms modern machines. Let's put some data to this overwhelming. <laughs> so essentially we're designing our systems such that uh, our storage, communication and computation capabilities are ev eventually overwhelmed. And if you look at the fundamentals of computing, you need to have fundamentally computation, communication and storage and memory. The way we've designed our systems is these three things are quite decoupled from each other. And not only that they're decoupled, there's only one place that's somehow deemed special uh, that does the computation. So you, 
that's the computing unit. It could be a CPU, GPU, FPGA, whatever, an accelerator. But data has to go there first. And every other unit is essentially a servant uh, to that uh, computing unit. And this leads to a lot of issues. I'll give you some examples of it. Uh, essentially, we design systems that are very compute centric. And even though they're compute centric, computation is a very small part of it. You have all of these uh, caches, interconnects, and other caches, and other interconnects. So most of the system becomes dedicated to storing and moving data, yet we're still bottlenecked by uh, data. I'll give you real pictures also. These are real pictures from real systems. So you can see that most of the chip is caches and memory interface. And we're adding more caches. And that's true for other, uh, uh, other real companies as well. And if you look at a real picture that looks like this, uh, a compute chip is really essentially a lot of SRAM. And then we have memory and storage. And these are essentially a lens of darkness because they don't actually do computation. So what's the result? Uh, the result is if you look at applications, most of the energy is spent on data movement, moving data across the hierarchy. These are, uh, this is data obtained from these applications. And in this paper, we actually analyzed the processing in memory approach uh, to accelerate these applications. And you see significant benefits if you offload important uh, uh, or data intensive uh, functions in these applications to uh, a near memory engine. Why? Because you reduce the data moment. And this number is actually relatively small, I would say, because we didn't use the largest data sets. Uh, so this number actually can go up to 90, 99% easily. And actually, we repeated this study more recently uh, with Google for the neural network models that they have. Uh, this is essentially the neural network models that they use uh, in their edge TPU. And we analyzed uh, these workloads. Uh, if you're interested, you can read the paper. We don't have a lot of time in this talk, so we're not going to go into detail. But you can see that more than 90% of the total system energy is spent on memory in large machine learning models that are running on edge uh, uh, TPUs. And I think this is true for training as well. So uh, the question is, how do we actually improve this? This paper proposes uh, heterogeneous accelerators to uh, uh, basically making the uh, neural network inference acceleration heterogeneous such that you have a compute centric accelerator and you have multiple different data centric accelerators and you ship the different layers uh, and models such that uh, to, to the appropriate accelerator uh, based on the bottlenecks that you see uh, in the models. And I think going forward, we need this sort of approaches where uh, we have more data centric or near memory accelerators that take uh, and perform the data intensive part of the tasks, but compute centric accelerators will always be there because there will be parts of the tasks that are better done in a compute centric manner. So future is really heterogeneous, but the heterogeneity should include processing capability uh, near memory and storage devices as well. Christina, feel free to stop me whenever, or now it's Georgi. So I don't, I don't need to tell him, he, he, know, he knows. I have only five minutes, really. You added the time that you were not here, I assume, right? Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, then I'm going to skip a lot of that. Basically, I think my takeaway message to uh, many of you is we really need to think across the stack. Uh, uh, we, we really need to take algorithms uh, and design the stack such that we can accelerate those algorithms uh, with uh, devices at the bottom. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this, this needs to be done in a data-driven uh, data manner. And if you're interested, again, there's a short paper that we've written that talks about this topic. Now, uh, let me give you a couple of examples uh, from our experience. I'm going to skip a lot of slides here, but uh, we want to design data-centric architectures. What does it mean? Uh, this means that you need to enable processing at every possible place, and you need to distribute the processing in an intelligent manner such that you can, uh, you can accelerate the application. So in the end, I think the vision is that this chip in everywhere should be able to do processing. Today, it's not true. Even though it's a compute chip, a very small fraction of it is active doing processing. Most of it is actually passive serving those processing units. And then this chip, these chips over here should be able to do processing and they can do processing in parallel. Actually, they have a lot of parallel processing capability. Uh, these chips over here that are darkness should be able to do processing. And these sensors should be able to do processing. Essentially, as data comes in and moves around the system, it has to be processed so that you don't need to move the data to a centralized piece of this unit uh, and overwhelm the system. And I think in the end, uh, this leads to a more distributed processing system uh, where you have distributed agents operating on the data. In the end, at least a different programming model, in my opinion, also uh, than today. But we could have potentially extend our programming models uh, too. And uh, I'm going to skip this, but uh, there are a lot of interesting papers over here. Let me give you one example, very starting simple. 
Uh, and then before Georgi yells at me, I'm going to stop. <laughs> or maybe I'll let him yell at me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to... Uh, so uh, I will briefly mention graph processing because I think it's extremely important, uh, even today. Uh, but let's do this one. Okay. So essentially, uh, I think in the end, we really need to have a more distributed model. But of course, that's not easy to achieve because uh, it requires a different way of thinking, different way of thinking about algorithms. A lot of distributed computing people have been looking at this, but we're used to accelerators. Accelerators is an easier step uh, to go memory centric. Uh, we're building a lot of accelerators as you see over here in the compute centric part. Why not actually treat memory as an accelerator also and accelerate different applications? So, uh, so what are those different applications? Graph analytics is I think still extremely interesting. It is used in many, many, uh, different applications. And this is one thing that we have looked at when we were uh, looking at um, near memory computing uh, in 2011 or so, let's say. And uh, here, the application has a lot of parts that has random memory access and little amount of computation. And uh, things like this uh, are a good fit uh, uh, where you can put memory and logic together. Uh, essentially, emerging technologies where logic is coupled uh, together with memory is a good example. And again, this is one example of uh, 3D stacking. There are other examples that are actually more aggressive in my opinion. Uh, but if you actually have a chip like this, you can build a distributed system of these chips by connecting these chips. And then you can actually uh, add computation to the logic layers. And this logic layer can actually operate on graph nodes without moving the graph nodes uh, uh, to, uh, so updates to the graph nodes are done locally and you move the graph node to another, uh, log uh, another logic layer or another processor only when it is necessary to do so, uh, so that you can combine things, for example. Okay, so if you do this, you get a lot of performance improvements, and this looks a little bit different, as you can see. It's not the traditional memory processor dichotomy. You actually have these distributed system of memory and logic chips coupled together. Okay, I'm not going to go through this. I'll give you another example of this, but this is uh, an early example. I believe this is actually very interesting still, there's more to do over here, and we need to actually look at more analog ways of accelerating graph processing. Let me give you one example, and I'm going to stop. Uh, I think storage is extremely important. We should never forget storage. Uh, and I will. Uh, uh, we we have been doing some work on accelerating uh, application and storage, genome sequence analysis in particular. I'm going to skip this part. But basically, we've been uh, genome sequence analysis has been accelerated using a lot of heuristics, accelerators, and filters on this side. But the real problem is actually on the storage and sensors in the end. You get, generate so much data that it needs to be stored. So you can reduce the computation overhead and some memory overhead over here. Uh, but the real problem from uh, data movement overhead for the storage system remains. So that's what we have been tackling uh, in more recent works. And the idea is essentially to start simple, uh, use filtering mechanisms inside the storage system, such that you don't move the data to this other parts of the system. So storage system becomes a little bit intelligent, does some filtering. Then the question is what kind of filtering should it do? I think it needs to be very configurable, but it also needs to be application specific. Basically, there's some reads, uh, like in this particular case, we're trying to figure out uh, alignment uh, to a sequence, uh, a reference genome. So you can easily figure out some uh, reads uh, that you chopped in the, uh, uh, in the genome you sequenced uh, that match or don't match, and that could be a good uh, potential for acceleration. And if you look at the results, you get significant performance and energy improvements, even with this simple approach. Now imagine what you can get uh, if you actually do this in a much more extensive way. I'm going to stop here since we don't have time, uh, but I'd be happy to take questions. It is clear that in these applications are important. Actually, we always say the problem is there is a problem, there is, there is an algorithm that solves the problem. And you write an application for by all the code and only of course you know solve this because he has been dealing with some people for many years. <laughs> now uh, we figured out that you need uh, bioinformatics, but also one graph processing when you can do it in place to make all the sense. You, you see the importance of locality. I am on the other side of the island. If there's a congestion, I cannot make a contact. So do the processing close to the data. Do not do it as we're doing all these stuff. But this uh, Oxford is it really 
so cheap these days. I remember I bought the first device for thousand euros. Thousand euros was cheap, <laughs> but I think it's a lot cheaper uh, these days. But but of course it depends on the device, right? If, if it's uh, smaller, it's less less capable also. Yeah. Although capability has been increasing. <laughs> You need also a big freeze, uh, you need uh, a lot of chemicals to do the reactions. So it's not as easy as it sounds. I was thinking, hey, we have this device that we can read the data, make a custom computer to process it. But there was a lot of steps before needed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly there is also the, the uh, preparation steps, yeah. right, that need to uh, enable sequencing. But I mean, they, they need to be done uh, in other devices that also exist, right? The Lumina, for example, certainly. But those devices are on the order of million dollars. <laughs> I'd rather pay thousand dollars to do the sequencing on an embedded device than pay million dollars to. Yes. Uh, yeah. But I think I will also mention that it's not that hard. Also, there are people like uh, uh, high school students, for example, who do this analysis uh, in their backyard. Let's say so. It is possible. Yes. <laughs> Everything application specific when we were talking about kind of team members and things, was there any effort, as you said, to generalize it, like mm -hmm. have a full programming model and, and read in general for those institutions? Yeah. And if it's so, uh, how does it fit with market spread uh, programming? Uh, you know, yeah. Where does synchronization go then? Do you also avoid those thoughts <laughs> as well? So I mean, <laughs> questions. Not lots of questions. <laughs> all, all, all of these are all of these are works that are ongoing, and uh, I mean, you asked a question that covers, let's say, hundreds of papers. <laughs> but uh, so the answer, the high level answer is yes. There is a lot of effort to make it general purpose. In fact, this uh, this thing that we proposed was very general purpose. Uh, you have uh, core processing cores uh, that are uh, essentially low power uh, cores. That are next to memory, and you can program them. That in order for over there, I should probably do it this way. Is very general purpose, so you can actually accelerate any application this way. And there's a programming model coupled in this. I'm picking at a particular example, of course. Uh, there's a programming model coupled with this. It's more like distributed system programming, remote function call based programming. So you can actually accelerate many applications this way. Uh, but of course, is this the right model? That's a good question, right? There. This is this is one one form of uh, pro, uh, memory centric computing, which is. You have a core near memory. There are other forms that we did not have time to discuss, like analog computation uh, inside a device uh, where you can do matrix vector multiplication, for example. That's a very different type of model, and that requires a different way of uh, programming. Uh, similarly, we have other models, like you can do block bitwise operations inside DRAM uh, uh, that, again, I didn't have time to discuss. That requires another way of interfacing. And there could be multiple different ways of taking advantage of that model. So these are great questions, I think. So going back to synchronization, yes, it's important. Synchronization can also be potentially accelerated by putting things that communicate together next to each other near memory, if you know what those things are. And people have actually looked at trying to do that. Uh, but you do need to also synchronization mechanisms for this sort of architectures as well. And if you're interested, we have a paper that, that specifically looks at synchronization and near memory computing architectures in HPCA 2021. Uh, if the computation takes place directly in memory, then all the bit threads are seen instantly, so you don't have to synchronize them. Uh, I mean, uh, okay, so there, <laughs> I think there are two issues here. Uh, semantically, <laughs> okay, sure, yeah, yeah. But semantically, you may need to synchronize them still, right? Semantically, they may need to operate on data. But uh, but physically, physically, synchronization may happen in a particular location that's right next to memory so that you don't need to move the uh, data that or metadata that enables you to synchronize. So I understand what you're getting at, but I think semantically there needs to be some synchronization mechanism still. And by the way, in the dirty reality, putting things together, the how to communicate in our requires some application specificity. You know, it is not a general but by the way, this is a discussion uh, that requires a lot of coffee and beer. Mm -hmm. It's a <laughs> short question. Coffee is here, but not beer. Yes, we'll come later. <laughs> okay, good. So let's thank all again. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And last week was said.
and very correctly pointed by Olur, you have to go through the star. So that's why we said for the same problem, you can have multiple solutions, multiple algorithms. Then you decide to map one of the Olur mentioned some of the work that they are doing. Um, one possibility is the one that is going to be presented in the next presentation by Antene and the next Always a problem with your family name. I will help you get the game. The old views. You will almost think that he's Greek. For the first time I saw the game, I think now we have a Greek boy. So Antene received his PhD. From the council, we need to